Uh, I want to share with you about how I approach mixing skin tones. And in many ways, it's very simple. But uh, it's, hard, it's kind of hard to explain. So I have put together some things to show you to try to um, make it make sense. So in a nutshell, when I paint somebody, I, it doesn't matter what their skin tone is, if they're dark skinned or light skinned. The first thing I ask myself, uh, in general, in the mid-tones, uh, what color is it? Is it red or yellow? I don't ask myself if it's brown or orange, never. Is it more red or is it more yellow in that section? I'm going to talk about shadows and highlights in a minute, but the bulk of the skin tone mixing that I want to share my approach with is, is done in the mid-tones and shadows are simple. So I try to keep it very simple and I use a yellow and a red and then I always will neutralize it, shift it with either a blue, a green, or a black. And there's a lot of different ways I do this. And, uh, and I've brought some paintings and then I have some slides we're going to show where hopefully uh, will make sense to you. So there's a plethora of ways to do it. I am not an artist who pre-mixes color. That actually takes the joy out of it, just saps the fun out of it for me. So when I started painting, I'm trying to right off the bat find a color chord that's harmonious together that works with the person I'm painting and the background that they're in and the <coughs> harmonies feel right. I'm making a guess when I start off. I might start off with yellow ochre, alizarin crimson, French ultramarine blue and I play around with it a while and I'm like, oh that's not it. Let me try a different chroma, a cad yellow, you know, a cad red medium and then add a different blue or green. So I'm trying to find it but pretty quick I establish which way I'm going to go. So I brought um, I hope this makes sense because I was trying to figure out how to share this. I did give a handout that has my, my palette colors and the brands. And if you're online, uh, Margaret said she'll send out an email with this because the brands matter. And most mostly I use Winsor & Newton, but there's a few exceptions in there. And um, I have a lot of colors on my palette. I can take it down to a... Um, simplified palette but this is what I end up basically working from most of the time and some of the colors I like on there because they're weak and some of them I like because they're strong there's and then others I like because they're transparent and there's things you can do because they're transparent so when I started painting I have these envelopes I have one for every painting I do and I might put the drawing in it or photo references. If I get a piece of clothing, I'll put that in it so I don't lose it. Uh, when I go to my clients, if they tell me things I need to put in a note, I put it in here so I have it and it just keeps it all together and I have a basket of these. <laughs> and I take notes when I'm painting and this has helped me more than anything. I've been doing it since I started painting in 1990. I used to work on little index cards and now I've moved up the ladder to envelopes and uh, I write down things that I discover while I'm painting and so on, on this one I had written down here um, this is our, our granddaughter Kaylin um, that I started off with cad red deep cerulean and cad yellow pale for my color cord and I, I will say that whatever ends up being the color cord for the flesh ends up in the background doesn't work there's, it doesn't have harmony if it's not kind of working everywhere. And that also helps me dictate skin colors because the, the background, the clothing, the whole environment affects the skin tones. Like I, I did a sitting the other day and uh, when I arrived, the mother said, well, can you paint his outfit blue instead of taupe? And I said, I think the taupe is lovely. If I tried to change it to blue, it wouldn't look real because you have reflections in the skin when you, whatever color you're wearing. 
and that would change the skin tones. So in trying to demonstrate this, I did this uh, color palette that shows you that this whole top half is the cad yellow, pale, the cad red deep, and cerulean. And I like cerulean a lot. It, and not, a lot of people don't paint with it, but I love it that it's weak, unless you use Old Holland, it's real strong, but I use the Rembrandt, which is listed on there. And the way it just works with Cad Red Deep is just beautiful. It, it works great with Yellow Ochre too. But I just, just started uh, mixing these together to show you, and you can kind of see how some of these, these skin tones, you can see this palette, how it's in here. And when I was doing this, then I thought, um, oh, I switched to another one where I did it in a color wheel. But anyway, you can see, like, you can get into the greens, the blues. When You you can go in so many directions. You can get into deep shadows uh, with these same colors. And, uh, and then when I came back later, because I paint in layers, uh, the last layer I did, um, I did permanent red deep which is basically uh, permanent matter deep which is just like alizarin crimson permanent but it's the rembrandt and i just like it better and um, for some reason with yellow ochre pale and cobalt so i ended up uh, on the last layer i switched to a different but it's just really important to keep one color dominant whichever way you go so you can ask yourself, is this a beautiful color? Now that I've mixed it, is it reading more purple where I'm trying to paint like under the eyes? Or is it more of a green? Or is it more of a yellow tone? Is it more of a red tone? And I'm always asking myself, which way does it lean? And that is affecting how I'm mixing the colors together. And so, the yellow and the red is pretty obvious to me. But what is less obvious is purple, blue, and green. So I'm always asking myself, does this lean purple, blue, or green? And then I mix accordingly to adjust for that. Does this mean I never put in a fourth or fifth color? I generally don't ever put in a fifth. But I might add a fourth color occasionally, like it just needs it. So if I'm mixing something and it needs to be warmed up, I use cut orange or burnt sienna to warm it up. If it needs to be cooler, I might go to a different blue or to a, a green too. But there's just a basic flesh approach that ends up working for each painting, and each painting's different. I feel like I'm talking in circles. Is this helping y'all at all, or is it just yeah. like... <laughs> <laughs> is it like confusing? Yeah, and I, question, yeah. Yes. Do you want us to ask questions? Oh, you certainly. Have, do you prepare that sort of a palette, you know, colors on paint like that for every painting, or you just made it just to? I did this for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> some of them are still wet. I got the, some of the paint on me tonight. So if you pick them up, you can pick them up and handle them. Some of them haven't dried all the way. I did them last week, and it was like taking hours to do this. And, but I felt like it was Im important to kind of see how you can push colors from different. Because you'll, you'll see different paintings call for different um, colors. Have you shared? Don't don't worry about sharing that one. But if you can go to the next. Um. So in this painting of um, Anne Stewart McPhail, and actually I was pulling the wrong thing now. This one was Kalis, where I did Cad Red Deep Cerulean and Cad Yellow Pale, which is what that is. Sorry, I was looking at my notes on. Um, this one got kind of messy, and and. When I struggle, sometimes it gets messy or I, I keep changing how I'm working. But I'll, on this one, all the flesh, I pretty was pretty much consistent with uh, permanent matter deep, raw sienna, and viridian, yeah. which is what you see on this top half. Raw sienna was your Yeah. So this is the same exact colors done as a color wheel. <laughs> So here I'm taking, um, I'm going to set this back here. And 
and it's just, I'm trying to show you how I go opposite. So I'm thinking in my head without even knowing what I'm thinking, I'm thinking complementary all the time. So like when I'm in yellow, I'm mixing it with a purple, which I got the purple from the red and the green. Because viridian and permanent alizarin or permanent matter deep make a green color. But it just becomes intuitive. But I'm sticking to just two or three colors. You don't have to, sometimes you don't need a third color in the flesh. But I almost always need two. Very, very rarely will one color in white, and I'm not even mentioning white, so y'all just know I'm putting white in there. But uh, very rarely, except in a highlight, will I use a pure color with white. It always needs just a touch of something. Uh, but in the midtones, it's at least two, and if not three. If your colors are getting muddy, then you're putting too much in there. So just try to go for the simplest approach. And um, anyhow, and this just shows you how it neutralizes down. So when you have it where it's getting more into the greens, then you're putting heavier reds. You still might add a touch of yellow in it. Uh, but when, when you're getting more of a purple mix, when you add more of the yellows to it, you just get a rich mix. Yes. Carol, how on the um, little girl back there, mm -hmm. how how do you treat like that shadow effect on her forehead, and then on her on her forearms, the shadowing as it relates to the color of the skin? So, on the in the shadows, I typically just use a couple of colors, and I will occasionally add a dot of another color, and I think. For me, one of the biggest things with skin tones is to um, balance the color mix as well. Like you, many times a third color I'm adding, I'm adding just a dot of that color to it. And, uh, or it'll push it too hard in a direction. But with my sh sh uh, shadows, I'm always thinking complementary. And so I will use a red with a green or I will use a orange with a blue or a purpley blue. And uh, so I often mix the purple. I saw a demo that um, Jeremy Lipkin did. Actually, it was a video demo. And uh, he mixes a color, I call it Lipkin purple. It's alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue. And I do it with a permanent matter deep and key it a little bit more toward the blue with just a little bit of white. It ends up looking kind of like Old Holland's uh, French violet, French, what is it? Uh, violet gray. But it's a, it's a purpley gray color. That is beautiful mixed. Any purple like that mixed with a cat orange or a cat yellow medium, just, just a touch of it, makes that color just sing. And that's one of the things that Mark Shatoff and Constantine taught me was if your shadows are looking too dull or pasty, put a little cadmium in it and it just adds life to the color. And, um, and I also, and I, I'll show uh, another painting in a minute where I've used black. So when I was trained, I never used black. And for years, I never painted with black. And then I studied with Richard Whitney, and he had black. And he's like, how can you paint without black? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so I added it to my palette. But I don't think of black as black. I think of black as blue, because it is really a blue color. And like uh, burnt sienna, I don't think of it as brown. It is a red color. And so I'm always in my mind without even knowing it, that's what I'm thinking of. So when I'm thinking, how do I neutralize a color? What does it need? Does it need blue to it? Or does it need a green to it? Does it need a strong one, a soft one? And a lot of it, y'all, is just playing around till I find that color cord that works. And then after I had this basically painted, then uh, my final layer, I ended up doing, um, I should have written it down here. Um, yes, I did permanent matter D with cobalt, which just makes a gorgeous violet purple. And then I neutralized that with yellow ochre pale. I did, went over the whole background 
using that. And then I went and put it in the flesh. And so it creates like this harmony in the whole painting because the colors are all throughout the painting. They're not just in the flesh. And I just have to say on burnt sienna something I never do and I can recognize it in a lot of paintings where people will just, I'm not saying people can't pull this off, but most don't pull it off, where they use burnt sienna and white for their flesh. Just don't do that. It looks dead. Even when you put a little blue with it, it just doesn't sing. It doesn't have life. You can get it the right value. And there's certain artists I look at and them, it's like burnt sienna, burnt sienna, burnt sienna. <laughs> so I only use burnt sienna to warm something. Like I'm, I have a red and I want it to go a warmer red. Or I will use it real thin for transitions. And it is like marvelous, like for shadows around the nostrils, painting with it really thin, and you can put just a little touch of something else with it. And that's one of the reasons I like cerulean, even like cerulean, because it's so weak with a little burnt sienna, can make these wonderful little transitions. And like, so can you do it without weaker colors? Yes, it's just a simple way for me to land there. Um, I don't know how much time I've taken. And then there was on the, if you go to the share the screen, Donna, um, something else and go to the next painting. This one right here, this little boy, it was the same uh, palette that I used with this Ann Stewart McPhail. So it was that uh, permanent matter deep, raw sienna and viridian for the heart of his flesh. And the highlights, it tends to be one or two colors max. And I'm asking myself, is it blue or is it purple? Because I can see those warm ones so easy. They just, I don't even have to think about it. If it's, if it's like a warm highlight that's an orangey color, it's just so obvious. But I have to really search for the blue highlights and the purple highlights to make sure that I'm seeing them. Does, does anybody else do that? Or do y'all just see it easy? <laughs> and then this one um, of Charlie goes in a completely different direction. So I, as I'm making these charts, I keep coming up, trying to come up with a better way to do it. And in the end, I just go back to throwing paint around. But thought this was way too much trouble. But... Um, you can see on here, the all around the top and the two sides, this is yellow ochre pale, and it's permanent red medium and French ultramarine blue. And all across the top and the sides, that's just those three colors. And I'm just shifting them. More yellow, more red, more blue. In the center, I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to show on the same chart, instead of using blue as my neutralizer, what if I did black as my neutralizer, which remembers blue, a blue? Or if I did viridian green instead of one of the blues? And you can just see the difference in this chart. Y'all can come study this um, later. Of course, we're always asking ourselves, what is the correct value, what is the correct temperature, and I will confess, I don't think value so much anymore, I just think color, color temperature, and I'm thinking, how does it move across the form, and when I'm thinking form, it just, value is happening, does that make sense? Did you say that again? Okay, so I, I'm, I think temperature, I first ask myself, Hugh, what is the color? Is it cooler or is it warmer? Because that helps me sometimes choose which way I'm going to go. Uh, in, uh, because in uh, him right here, in Charlie, I went to a permanent red medium because it's a brighter chroma. Because he's outside and he has this glow, you know, with that outdoor lighting. And it's also so hard to paint 
uh, when somebody's outdoors like that and basically their face ends up flat and you have to have color temperature to shift it. I mean, there are value changes, but they're very subtle. The painting I did of Kalen is a whole lot easier with the more defined lighting and stronger values. But so back to repeating this review. So then I'm asking basic color. I'm asking, is it uh, warm or cool? And then I'm asking myself, how is this color moving across the form? I'm trying to think like a sculptor and I'm trying to think of the shape. Uh, and when I'm thinking that, how does this color move from this plane to this plane? It forces me to analyze value without asking myself value. Because I guess I ask myself questions that I struggle with. And I struggle with form. Wanting to get that feeling of dimension. That's something I want to do better. So that's why I'm asking myself this on the form. And so if you can share screen now and you can just keep it shared and then I will keep going. Okay, on this little boy, uh, Rawlings, he is also the same exact um, color chart as Charlie. That was the permanent red medium, yellow upper pale, and French ultramarine blue. See, it's really simple, y'all. It's really simple. A red, a yellow, and then do you want to neutralize it with blues or greens? It's pretty much how I think. All right, so the next slide. And are these coming up in screen sharing from my computer so they're the better images? Oh, yeah. So y'all who are here, you, you see now how the images on this don't look near as good <laughs> as the paintings. Uh, and so you can go uh, to the next one. Okay, Georgia Purvis, and her, her skin tones look so much prettier in, on my laptop screen than on that, but anyway. Um, this is Cad Yellow Medium with Permanent Red Medium and French Ultramarine Blue, and I've just got all these gorgeous purples that are in her skin tones, and they're in the painting as well, and in the subtleties, these uh, grayish colors. and. Um, Richard Smith said, enjoy colors as they appear on the canvas. And I watched a demo years ago, Kathy Anderson did uh, painting flowers and she would just get so excited about a color. And then, oh, that's such a beautiful color. And oh, that's a beautiful color. And, and I started asking myself as I'm painting, is this a beautiful color? <laughs> you know, if it's not a beautiful color, it is not dominant enough. It's just becoming blah because it is, needs a touch more blue or a touch more green or a touch more orange. You know what I'm saying? Uh, there's no shadow that it's like blah. It always leans in a color direction. And then the next one. Okay, this one, uh, Alice Long. This is just so interesting. Um, this, this one's still pretty wet. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently these colors don't dry easy. So again, this is that Cad Red Deep with Cad Yellow Medium, and that is um, Cobalt Blue. Can you show that closer to the camera? Sorry. And you just get all these luscious, luscious warm colors and blues. And they're different. It, they might not be hugely different, but it's different with when you switch one color, what you can get with it. And that's why it's just so much fun to explore it and see see what all you can get. But um, when y'all will look at, if, if um, I don't know if we can share some of these in a different way where you can see them where they don't, because that just looks dead on that screen. But anyway, uh, you can go to the next one. So this one, Melinda, uh, and I will show this down here is actually cadmium scarlet, cad yellow medium, and ivory black. And this has, this painting had a lot of yellow in it. And it was, had a lot of intensity in it. And these just worked for it. And one of the things you're going to notice in the painting, so if we can go back to the painting screen, is that, um, and I wish you could see the richness of it, but anyhow. Uh, the yellows that are in the background 
are also showing up in her skin and in her hair. And then the uh, blues that are in her clothing also goes into her flesh tone. So it's, it's like it's all intermixing so that it doesn't feel uh, disjointed. Do y'all have any questions while they're, um, yes? Um, with her background, is that something you made up or is it an actual background? That's a good question. So I made it up. Okay. So uh, Melinda that I painted, she is the head of the Love Lady Center in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And Portrait Sync uh, is, are their big supporters uh, of this organization, which helps women coming out of sex trafficking and out of prison. It's a huge, huge operation in Birmingham. And Melinda basically runs it. And um, Portrait Sync is doing a whole group of portraits where they have portrait artists all over the country painting women who've gone through the program and come out of the program or maybe some are still in it and uh, it's going to be an exhibition that travels and there's going to be a book produced to raise money to help uh, to help it keep going so when I went to photograph Melinda it's like an old school slash hospital building that's just this big um, cavernous with fluorescent lights, this big auditorium where I am, with a you know a 1960 school stage, and then there's this wooden cross podium, and that's where Melinda speaks, and she speaks to the women all the time. She brings the messages. So I was trying to do a portrait that shared some about her faith and her message, and I did all these photographs, and I came home, and they were horrible. <laughs> I had horrible pictures. It's like my light got lost in that big room. So I just contacted her. I said, I just need to come back. And I paid my daughter, who's really good, to come back with me and help me do photographs. And so with the two of us working. And I still wanted that podium in it. And I thought, and I, before I went back, I thought, well, maybe if I do her seated on the stage, then I can have the podium behind her so we'd see the cross, but it wouldn't be too important. And so then I painted it, and the cross was like way, way, way too important because... Uh, I, I wanted it to be inspirational, so I ended up with a suggestion of the cross and the light of Christ shining down on her. And uh, and also, when I went to photograph her the first time, she didn't have on any jewelry, and she had on all black. And so I just, you know, kindly said, Melinda, you are such a fun person, and I want your personality to come out. So wear something with color, bring some jewelry, and uh, so sometimes it's worth it to go back and do another session and, and push your client. But anyway, I love the painting now, but, and they love it. So, uh, How long do your photo sessions last? Like that? Usually an hour at the most. Um, if I was a good photographer, I, it would help. I did, I'll probably take um, three to 600 photos in an hour. And I just am, am amazed and love these people who are very methodical and only take a few and get these great images. But I'm just like, please, Lord, help me get something good. <laughs> 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 so I just keep going. <laughs> okay, the next, uh, the next one is. Um, sorry, they're having a hard time. Uh, I, I would tell you which one it is, but I think it's going to be just as hard. So I'm going to go ahead and go with Justice and his painting will come up. But anyway, isn't that luscious? Look at those colors. I mean, I just think those are so wonderful. And this is yellow ochre pale, permanent matter deep and cerulean. And you may wonder why I have yellow ochre pale and yellow ochre on my palette. And I've tried to let go of one and I just end up putting, keeping them both on there. Yellow ochre pale is very strong. It, I mean, you cut it with white and it, it can overpower. It's a beautiful color. But yellow ochre is weaker and richer. And sometimes that weaker color mixes better than this one. But this just shows you, look at how rich and deep I can get the colors with this. As well as... Um, what, is that? what is the last one? The blue it's cerulean. And that's the uh, Rembrandt Cerulean, which is not really expensive as um, as some of the Ceruleans are. Yes? So I, I didn't quite catch up. These are standard sort of admixtures that you are that you go back to or for each 
reference you're making a new everyone I'm just trying to figure it out but I don't make these charts I made these just to show y'all how I'm mixing uh, color so each one you approach and you say I think this looks like cerulean yeah and I just try it and then sometimes <laughs> and I, I probably yeah well, here we go uh, well no I didn't mark that out but there's on some of these I'll write something down and try it and then I come back and I look at it the next day and I'm like oh that's horrible and I'll just mark it out and do another mix so I don't, I struggle with a lot of paintings. Occasionally, my, uh, I can figure it out, but my husband can testify. I mean, I'll just be like, I don't know why I'm struggling with this. I can't, I can't figure it out. I can't figure out how to mix colors. <laughs> but maybe that's why I take notes, because I can remember how a painting looks. And so maybe uh, when I've done like a child in a pink dress and a, all this pink surrounding and I'm doing somebody else, in those color tones and I can't figure it out, I'll go back and look up how I did it. And it might work, it might not work, but it at least gives me a starting point. Um, I would say it, that first layer, if you paint in layers like I do, don't think too hard on it. Just try something that you think works and let it go. Then when you come back, you can adjust it if you need to. But, um, and y'all can look at this, but I transition as I go on, uh, on what works. And I even made notes like on uh, Kaylin's painting and how I did the chair and uh, what worked for green. I, I did Viridian and Cerulean with a little burnt sienna and I just like loved it. And I'm like, I need to write this down because I won't remember what I did. It's amazing to me all the ways you can mix color and I can't remember what I discovered, but I can remember the painting I discovered it on, and I can go pull my notes and see what I discovered. <laughs> I do drawings. Uh, like this is, uh, but not unless they request it. Um, this is like a drawing I did of um, Ann Stewart McPhail, the one that's back there. So the, I mail this to the client, they mail it back to me. Theoretically, that works, except for twice FedEx has lost drawings lately. So, how many layers? Usually four. It, it varies. Uh, probably four in the head, maybe three in the background. And when you say you, you give it to them wet, what if it's going to California? Well, if I'm shipping it, I have to wait a few days before I ship it. I have shipped wet paintings and had to rig it up. No, it's hard. <laughs> so I try not to do that. <laughs> but I didn't want to, I have, I've had, since I've had trouble shipping this season, uh, that's why tomorrow I'm delivering that and another painting because uh, I'm just too nervous to ship them right now. But I will still ship. Uh, do you spray them? Mm -mm, I do not. Do you wait for the layers to dry? No. You just paint right on top of it. I just keep it. painting. But I paint lean to fat, so I don't worry about it. Uh, so in the beginning, I used a little Gamsol, and then I just pretty much just paint straight, and then I'll use a little oleo gel, but that's more for detail work. So I don't really use oleo gel for big passages. And I've played around with mediums, and I always get in a mess, and then I remind myself, why am I doing this? Why don't I just go back to the simple approach on what I know? But then I'll watch a video where somebody uses medium, it's so gorgeous, and I'm like, well, I need to try that again. <laughs> And then I get in a mess. I'm like, why am I trying it? Just, you know. And and that's one of the things is do what do it how you enjoy it and how it works for you. Don't feel pressured by anybody else. Like how I mix color may not be how like you'd like to work. So I like to just be mixing and I try to do the color streams and I do them, but I can't keep the same stream going all day like some of these guys can and girls. I'm just like you know, uh, I'm too messy. So I just have to scrape it off and start a new stream. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep starting with streams, <laughs> and that's just in your mixing puddle where you're mixing your colors. You're keeping yellow on this side of the mix and blue on that side of the mix and pulling it out. Right. But um, how much time would it take for you to paint like a little boy? Like, I did that in two weeks. Two weeks, like painting every day. Mhm. Mm well, probably painting six days a week on that, because I painted. I don't always paint six days a week, and uh, but I been under pressure lately. <laughs> how many do you turn out? How, how you do, like you paint for the year? How many can you paint? Ronald, do you know how many I painted last year? 
<laughs> yeah. Wow. But there's sometimes I, some paintings can take forever, and I can't tell you why. You want to ask me? I was going to ask you if you, the background again of that little boy is that a true background, or did you again make that up? Well, I enhanced it. So, but he was actually sitting on a concrete curb on the driveway because I had taken all these photos and none of them just I didn't love any of them and then I said well just sit down there and then it was like oh I love this so I tried to make it look kind of like rock or something I don't really know what it looks like but it looks better <laughs> it looks better than the concrete curve <laughs> and when I did that I really try to have fun on that first layer and I uh, used a big brush and I did like transparent paints and like in, in this part I did like real bright yellow and down in here I did I have dioxazine purple on my palette and I know that can be real strong and I hardly use it in flesh tones but it's just fabulous in backgrounds and I just put that on there real thin so then when I come back and paint on top of it it just adds a richness and sometimes I'm thinking methodically like um, do I want to put a certain color under a certain color for how it's going to read together because some of it will shut through not all of it but um, you talking about this little boy? yes yes so just as hard um i thought i was never going to finish this painting and that's the one that um i was shut this color thing right here and part of it is all the whites trying to make them interesting and make it work that are he's surrounded by and you know even his clothing and then it is so um, such small transitions in color in the skin tone and I kept thinking I had it and I was they were in New York and I would send them a digital image and she didn't respond for a few couple of weeks and that's you know that's usually not good occasionally <laughs> my clients are real busy and they just wait a while to respond so I try not to get panicky but I do start getting panicky and it's like well we love it but it's not quite him so then you know I paint on it for another week and then yeah we love it and then two days later but my mother came and looked at it and we still think it's not quite him and so this I guess it was two months that I kept struggling with it which is one of the reasons I'm delivering two paintings in person tomorrow because if they want something slightly adjusted when I'm there in person I'll bring my paints and I can figure it out and then we then we can move on and everybody be happy it's a little harder when you're uh, trying to do it online but so occasionally one like that will take eight weeks and then Charlie just happened to go well and I did it too so when they tell you it doesn't quite look like you, do they say the eyes, the nose, the mouth, or specific? I ask them that okay. and try to figure it out. Uh, but some of, one of the things I've learned to do is I uh, have an iPad. I paint from an iPad, but I also um, I have an older an older iPad. I used to do this with my phone, but now I do it with my old iPad. So I will take a photograph close up of the head with my reference, which is in my iPad, because I don't paint from hard copy photos and the head up close or or the whole painting but and then when I look at it on another one and I can put that beside me and I can say okay this is where it's off there's just something about photographing your reference with your painting and you can start to see what's off um, even taking a picture on your phone it reduces it down and reducing it down will help you see where you're off was this your final did yes, like yes, it? and now, now I'm going back to paint the siblings, so I hope that'll go better. When you're painting, do you um, enhance colors intentionally that you see, um, for instance, the, the little boy that we were just looking at, his face, was it as rich colored as you, on your iPad, as it, as you made it in your painting, do you try to match or do you? I do not try to match exactly. I push color. And on that first layer, I try to make myself push it more. I try to think bold, be bold. Like paint that bluer than you think it is. Paint it greener than you think it is. Because then when I come back 
on the next layer and soften it down. To me, it just sings and it has more life. And that's what excites me and that's how I enjoy painting. Uh, there are some, uh, I, I watched a demo that somebody did recently on mixing skin tones and they were using raw umber and something else and just keep pulling it down and I'm like, oh, this would just drive me crazy. But their work is fantastic. They're an amazing artist, so it's just not, how, I just like to push color. And I don't have raw umber on my palette because I can't paint with it. Every time I do, my colors go dead and dull. But I see artists who use it and that's not true. So I just don't know. The way I work, it just doesn't work for me. Uh, yeah, Penny Holt, uh, and then there, later, but it's too much trouble for you to shift, but there's a close-up of her. And this is one, I don't know, I just, uh, she had this intense background, and um, I just, right off the bat, tried the, it's the Permanent Matter Deep Ivory Black and Cad Yellow Medium, and so, um, and went for these intense colors and it just sang. It was like, oh my goodness, this is just working. You know, and I used it on the dress, I used it in her flesh and, you know, and I even used it some in the background and it was just like, and then I tried it on the next painting, it didn't work. So sometimes the mix just works with one setting and it doesn't work with the other. But I'll often remember, like I can't remember what I mixed for Penny, but I'll remember how I liked how her flesh read in that, and so I'll think, well, let me look up what I did, <laughs> if I can't figure it out. Th and this is where, um, it's the same thing, except with yellow ochre, I don't know if I've got it turned right, but it's yellow ochre instead of cad yellow medium. And I used this on Penny, and oddly enough, when my yellow was the yellow ochre, I used it for her cooler flesh tones. And when my yellow was the cad yellow medium, I used that for her warmer flesh tones. And that's how I balanced. Just switching my yellow was all I was doing to switch from cooler to warmer. And, and it just worked. But isn't it interesting how when you just switch out one color, the different nuances you can get from it. So that's... Um, really all I have. Uh, do y'all have questions? Did, and I think I said on the shadows enough. Um. <laughs> oh, yes? Do you mind talking a little bit more about the layers? Are we talking about layers all through the, do you do the whole painting in one layer and then? I will bring, let's see, I think I have an image um, and y'all can pass my phone around. Sorry for you people online. Um, perhaps a bit, yeah. So I have, um, it doesn't show the whole thing, but this, uh, let me start here. So this is Ann Stewart at the big first layer. It's what? The first layer. So it's just real quick. And loose. And if my paint's thick, if I paint like too crazy thick, I scrape it down before it dries. So I don't have brush strokes that are bad brush strokes messing up what I'm trying to do. I can't get the richness in one coat. I mean, you can get energetic and beautiful paintings, but. Uh, also, Carol, do you do um, just direct? paint without any turpentine? Or do uh, you use yeah, well I use Gamsol a little bit in the beginning okay. and then I try not to use it. Okay. So, um, anyway, I don't know if that helps with how I, with how I layer it. But you can tell on this, I, I, you can see in the, in the background where I had like a big brush and I'm just like, because it's I, I generally start with a white canvas, which I know you can get richer if you tone, but I just like working on white. I decided I like doing it that way, so I should do it that way. And um, I guess my first layer in a lot of ways is like, sort of like toning the whole thing, getting the whole um, thing working together and not overthinking it. Because when I start overthinking it, I waste a lot of time and try a lot of stuff that doesn't work. 
<laughs> you know, and uh, I did a class years ago with, um, I'll think of her name in a minute, but she said, just what is the simplest approach to get the color you're trying to mix? I thought, that's a real good question. You know, I think sometimes we think, well, it's su such a rich color, I've got to think real hard about it. But, you know, just what's the simplest approach to get that? And it's uh, Dunaway. What's her, Michelle Dunaway. Uh, she said that, and I thought, that's really good. Um, do you bring clothing with, because it seems like the girls all have that same frilly type, or do the parents buy those clothes for the kids? They buy clothes for them, and um, most of the time it's good. Occasionally it's not. <laughs> and I have gone through somebody's closet, and we have gone <laughs> shopping before. <laughs> Uh, but this one, because this is our granddaughter, so I got to paint it like I wanted to. She is not in a white dress. <laughs> it's not pale pink and it's not pale blue. <laughs> so I got online and I hunted some European clothes because I couldn't find it in American clothes and Spanish. And I bought this from a company that sells Spanish clothes. And I just loved this, uh, the richness of it and the detail. And it, to me, it was more timeless. Uh, I mean... I like the southern dress. Well, they're not just southern. They're all over the country. I like the little girls in their cotton white dresses, but I love painting something that's different. Um, Are most of yours in the white dresses? I end up with a lot, but um, usually with young children, it's not an issue. It's when they get older and when they're adults that I get into trouble with clothes. And so uh, I did a sitting with an older child, um, and they said, we're having trouble finding dresses because she was maybe 13. So I spent several hours online pulling uh, clothes that I thought were pretty and appropriate for a 13 year old and sent them to them. They didn't pick one of those, but it, you know, I sent that out as a guide. And, uh, and like I told you with Melinda, when I showed up there and she was all in black and I didn't want to say, and she was already so nervous about it. She didn't like being photographed and I didn't want to say, can we go to your house and go through clothes, you know, so, but that's why I ended up going back. Plus, I needed help with the photography. <laughs> but uh, anything else? Well, I, I hope that wasn't too confusing. There's a whole lot of color mixtures I haven't done on palettes because I didn't have time to just keep doing every one, but I'm discovering every painting, so it's not like I've got it figured out, but that's the fun of it, isn't it? I have a question. Yeah. What about your whites? What kind of white do you use? Well, I usually will start off with gambling titanium white because it's cheaper. I have start occasionally I will use uh, the first layer. I will use that uh, Winsor Newton Griffin white that's a quick dry white. Uh, I, I did saw a lecture where Scott Christensen uses it a lot in his first layer of painting, and that just made so much sense to me because it dries so fast. What brand was it? Uh, it's Winsor and Newton, and it's uh, they have a Griffin line, and it's a quick dry white. So just for my under layer, so it can dry within a day, and then I so then I'll switch to Gamblin white. But I just want to tell you there is a difference in Old Holland titanium white and any other titanium white I've used when I'm trying to get nuances where it's not overpowering. So on that last layer, I always switch to Old Holland titanium white, which is expensive, but I just don't do it all the way through. I also love Cremnitz white, but Winsor & Newton quit making it, and I've tried all different kind of lead whites and Cremnitz whites, and I have not come up with one yet to me that does what that did, because it would dry faster, and again, I could get real nuanced with it. Um, you don't make any mm -mm. Because of the lead. And that, the Rublev, I'll use that lead white number two, is really great for lace. It's real stringy. Yeah. So, I don't like it for like painting, in the painting, I see people do it and do great, but when I'm doing lace, if it's like real intricate, that string pulling can make you keep going faster. So what's the name of it? Uh, it's Natural Pigments Rublev is their uh, paint company and it's lead white number two. But um, you have to be careful with the lead whites in a lot of ways. 
Okay. Anybody else? Excellent. Well, I hope it wasn't too confusing. No. <laughs> So y'all can come look at these. We want to see you actually blend it and mix it. <laughs> but now you know why I didn't have time to try to do it before you, to yeah. do all the different colors. So.